Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service of the First Presbyterian Church, Eufaula, Alabama. Please stand and join me as we call ourselves to worship. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has raised. Come, worship the Lord of glory. Proclaim God's praise.
seated. I'd like to welcome you this morning on behalf of First Presbyterian Church to this second Sunday in Christmas and first, well, the Sunday of Epiphany. We're, we're observing Epiphany today, so uh, in, in traditional greeting style, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, because we are still in Christmas season. So um, I do invite you to come out Wednesday night as part of the WOW program. We're going to be talking more about Epiphany as that is the actual day that it's normally observed, which is January 6th, the 12th day of Christmas. Now, let's see, we have coming up Saturday, the elders will, are having a retreat at Living River and uh, we'll have more coming on that for officer installation. Right now it's looking like January because we're trying to get as many of the officers to be able to actually be here as possible. So we, we want to make sure that everybody gets recognized in that way. And we still, we will resume this week with midday prayer group on Wednesday at noon. We meet in the back of the sanctuary here. The, and the WOW program, of course, with that, an epiphany dessert that you understand as part of the program. So you have to come and be a part of it to enjoy it. So please do come out for that. And choir, choir rehearsal resumes January 13th. So as we continue to prepare ourselves for worship, let's remember in the light of Christ, we see the shadows of our world and our hearts. So trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, you have given light to the world in Jesus Christ, but we have preferred to live in darkness. Your justice protects the weak and the distressed. Yet we seek shelter, privilege, and power. Your righteousness redeems the poor and the needy. Yet we seek the status of wealth and possessions. Your peace upholds the oppressed and the defenseless. Yet we seek the security of weapons and retribution. Forgive our sins and lead us to true repentance that we may trust in your things through Jesus Christ we pray Amen Friends, hear the good news Christ is the light of the world who grants forgiveness and healing of our sins know that we are forgiven and be at peace thanks be to God This time, I'd ask if we have any little ones to come forward. Good morning, sir. Those are some pretty cool shoes you have on there. There's a tradition that we don't do in this country that a lot of other countries do. In this country, we have Christmas, and we, you're familiar with that, aren't you? This big guy in a red suit and big white beard comes down your chimney and left something under a tree for you? Yes. Well, in other countries like Ethiopia, there are other people. See these guys, where are they? See those guys right there riding camels? Those are the wise men, the magi. Well, what these guys, they are scholars, and so they study all about the stars and nature and how things happen. Well, what, so what they do in other countries is they actually recognize, these are the three people who bought, brought some really cool gifts to Jesus. Excuse me. Yeah? Mama brought me some chips, and they are different kinds. Oh, that's good. <laughs> 
Well, so then what, we, what happens is over in Ethiopia to celebrate the three kings going to see Jesus, they leave their shoes outside their house and they fill them with straw. Yeah. Because what are they riding? They're riding camels. So what do camels eat? Straw. So then what happens is the camels come and they eat the straw on their way to see Jesus and as a thank you for the children who leave their shoes out with straw in them the wise men leave little gifts in the shoes for the children that's that's a pretty cool way to do things isn't it that's a little different than what we do with Santa but that's what they do in a lot of other countries so let's pray Heavenly Creator, we are so grateful for the many ways that we celebrate the gift that we have in Christ through you. Be with us this and every day. In his name, amen. Thank you, sir. <laughs> now, as we prepare our, to, for the readings, I'll invite you to go ahead and turn to the first reading in Isaiah, as we will be reading responsively, so I would like for us all to be reading the even verses, and I'll read the odd. You're welcome to join me on the odd ones as well, if you would like to. Let's pray. Spirit of God, in the proclamation of your word, reveal to us the hidden mystery of your love in Christ, and strengthen our faith that we may approach you with boldness. Amen. So our first reading today comes from Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 6. If you'll please join me on the even verses. Arise, shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For the darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness all the peoples. But the Lord shall rise, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall become far away. Your daughters very nurses. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the rays of the Lord. Here ends the first reading. If you'll please stand with me as I read from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Listen now for the word of the Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for as it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, 
Go and search diligently for this child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out. And there, ahead of them, went a star that had, they had seen it, in it as it's rising until it stopped over a place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And be seated. I'm sure whoever is in charge of the nativity set will be glad to see I have put the wise men back where they started. <laughs> they are with the nativity because this is the time that we observe. The wise men have found the baby. Now often we, we think about the pageants and everything that we put on, we want it to be a complete story. But in reality, the wise men wouldn't have been there in the nativity with the shepherds and with everyone else of that day. Now, when we look at the wise men, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on who they were. We can, you can read about that somewhere, you may already know. Basically, they were representing three different peoples. They were Gentiles. Let's talk about what they're about more than who they were. They're three different people coming from three different backgrounds, all Gentiles. So these are the first Gentiles to come and bear witness to who Christ is. These are the first Gentiles to seek out Christ. See, uh, Richard Niebuhr, uh, theologian, he likens revelation, because that, that's what this is about when we start talking about an epiphany. We're talking about a revelation. So Richard Niebuhr likens this revelation to a moment when we're reading a difficult book, seeking to follow a complicated argument, and we come across a luminous sentence from which we can go forward and backward and so attain some understanding of the whole. The same might be said for Epiphany. Epiphany is that moment when what's been happening makes sense as you look ahead for what will happen. You see there comes some moment when an important truth suddenly becomes clear and we interpret our past and rethink our way forward in light of it. At Epiphany, one of the most important and neglected holidays of the Christian year, there are some places, just like I was saying here, where Epiphany is actually more celebrated than Christmas. On Christmas, our Savior is born. But on Epiphany, it's realized where he's from and where he's going with the gifts, the gift for a king, the gift for the one who would give himself ultimately for all of mankind. So Epiphany points to us God's universal love and universal sovereignty, that God is ultimately aware of, is, has been part of everything to this point and will be part of everything forward. So in this, if you think about it, it's kind of like if you've ever been out at night or something and, and you're, you're trying to figure out, let, let's say you're, you're driving down the road and your headlights go out. Well, so you start thinking, well, now I've got to change the way I'm going because it's getting dark. I've got to go a different route. But then you go out and there's just a loose connection and you fix it. Then you can go back to your original path. You can go to a path that you couldn't see otherwise. 
when you're stumbling around in the dark at night and you have that that routine that you go through to get through your house to get you know whether it's up for that glass of water in the middle of night or what have you if something is in your way and you have to turn on a light switch well then you can see clearly and your path is made plain now these are relatively if you want to call them secular epiphanies these are times when we're just you know it's an epiphany in that a new path has been revealed that we couldn't see before a new path has been placed before us and it's up to us to move forward now we know where we were and we know where we are and now we see a new opportunity before us so the light reveals a direction that we could not imagine prior to this and we are changed by it in a way that opens us up to a new path a path in Christ now as you can imagine for many people this is how they get into seminary <laughs> you don't not not I, I know a few people who from the time they were able to talk wanted to be a preacher wanted to go to seminary wanted to be a part of this and then you have people on the other end of the spectrum who kick and scream the whole way because even though they have received this enlightening moment, this epiphany where God is calling them because of where they've been in their lives and where God is calling them to go for them to go to seminary and, and yet still you resist. Well, it doesn't make for an easy transition. It doesn't make for an easy enlightenment. It, it doesn't make it less challenging. It makes it more challenging. When I was called to seminary, some of you are familiar with my round one, round two stories. For me, it was a fulfillment of who I was up to that point. When I started seminary in 1997, when I started seminary then, it was the thing that made sense. It was the thing that God had put in front of me because of my journey so far, my relationship with the church, my commitment to the church, and, and who I was. But a different epiphany struck with my eye problems. And so before I could get halfway through with seminary, I realized I wasn't going to be able to continue. Well, there's somebody, you know, if, if we're using the analogy of, of a light or a candle, somebody just blew it out. <laughs> I was back in the dark. But in my mind, I still knew God was calling me here. In my mind, I still knew God was calling me to be a part of this. So praying about it, continuing with life, doing what I had to do to stumble around in the darkness until I could find someone who could fix my eyes. Didn't even imagine it was possible. I had no idea that it was possible. 2006, I went to Duke Eye Center, North Carolina. They went in, oh sure, we can fix that. Okay. <laughs> They made it sound, you know, yeah, that's just another day at the office for us. Fantastic. And so they corrected my vision. It caused me to have more problems. Uh, it changes depth perception. It changes uh, everything because it's a muscle issue. So I had to retrain my eyes. I had to practice reading to get my eye movement doing what I wanted it to do to get to seminary because if there's one thing you do a lot of in seminary it's reading <laughs> lots of reading but I did I was still called to that I was still called in that direction and the God working through a facility like Duke I of North Carolina created an epiphany for me 
while the doctors, and I have a feeling the doctor who performed my surgery would agree, while she did the surgery, she attained the knowledge that she has and the skills that she has because of her own epiphany where God called her to fulfill being a doctor. And on that particular day, I was only one of probably 10 patients having surgery that morning. But that surgery made it so I could return to seminary. Made it so that I could complete seminary. Made it so that I could fulfill that call that God had for me. Now, you, you will hear other people. Not, not everything has to be about standing up front and putting on the robe and the stole and the microphone that gets annoying and all of that. I had the pleasure while we were in Harabakoa last year of talking with Hoel, I guess two years ago now, technically. Uh, I had the pleasure of talking with Hoel a little bit and, and some of what you hear about from missionaries. You see, missionaries aren't necessarily preachers. They're there, they're doing God's work. They're working in the name of Christ and they're called to do that. And so what, they ha what has happened for them is a similar call process. It's, there was a moment of enlightenment when it was clear, this is a ministry that's needed. Talk to the Kay family, you'll hear a similar story. Something happens in their life that reveals a path that you can't imagine without God's presence, that you can't turn away from no matter how much you want to, and that you have to live into. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to be a preacher. It doesn't mean that you have to be a missionary. It means that you're living into what God has called you for. It means that you're living into fulfilling Christ's mission for the church. Now, we do that in all kinds of ways. Some of us do that through our work. Just being a good Christian, you know, that, that's what we, we see all the little things on Facebook, all over the internet about what it means to be a Christian. We know what it means to be a Christian, to be Christ-like, to be inspired by Christ, to use Christ as a model, if you will, for humility, a model for wisdom, a model for righteousness. A measuring stick. We know we can never reach it, but we can try. We can set that before us. Now, when we start talking about epiphany for a church, it can mean, now here, here's where we get a little uncomfortable, because <laughs> we, we like our routines. We like our traditions. We, lo no, we love our traditions. We love the way things have been done for 150 years. And it doesn't mean that we have to let go of that. But what it does mean is what we have to do is be open to where God is calling us today. Where is God illuminating our lives to call us in a particular way? Has God already done it and we're enacting it now? One of the ways is with living waters. When this church goes to Harabakoa in February... We're going to be installing another clean water system. When we do that work, as you talk about another good story, talk to Bill about it. Or anyone who was part of that first group who really got inspired, who got fired up and said, this is what God is calling us to do. Because not only was it their own, they were inspired to do it, things happened and were put in place so that success was inevitable. God doesn't set us up for failure. God sets us up for success. Success in service to God. Success in ministering to others. Success in reaching out to others. God wants us to be Christ's hands at work in this world. Now, again, there are all kinds of ways that we can do that. Whether it's being the best mechanic, engineer, plumber, whatever. And witnessing the folks along the way. 
That's incredible. When someone decides to join the military, often there's an epiphany, a moment of realizing, well, you know, uh, this is what I'm called to do. And it starts them on a path. There was a friend of mine uh, who, whose son went in to be a, a police officer. And the father was a little disappointed. He had always imagined his son would go into ministry. Now he himself is an architect. But because of the way that he knew his son, and the kind of person he knew his son to be, he wanted him, he just knew that he was cut out for the ministry, and even tried to encourage him that way along the way. And then after his son became a police officer, and he starts telling his father about some of his work of the day, he realized he is a minister. And that what he's doing as a police officer is probably having more impact than what he could have done if he had forced himself to go to seminary. Because that's where he's called to be. So epiphany is often we've been traveling along a particular route and then this epiphany strikes us and we realize there's a new direction to go in and that's what happens with the church often what, what we happens as a church nowadays what we're seeing is churches that have been doing the same thing for a hundred years they realize they're, they're changing the way that they do church they're introducing other music. They're introducing other activities outside of church. They're introducing more mission. You see, the church was really strong a hundred years ago, but think about how strong our missionary efforts were back then compared to now. The Korean, my Korean friends who are first generation coming over and in ministry, many of them. They said, you know, American missionaries came over and, and educated us and helped us, changed their lives. Epiphany. Now, in turn, these Koreans see our country as a missionary field because they see how things are going and they want to provide they want to help facilitate what it means to have another epiphany a revival for the church if you will an eye-opening moment we all have them don't we so what I would encourage for this week as you consider this text as you wonder what in the world I'm going to fix for dessert on Wednesday night? As you think about all of these things that are going on, think about it. What spiritual practices do you engage to stay at peace? Where do you find peace in your life? What, where do you find courage? Where do you find courteousness? Where do you find a respectful regard for difference with other folks. Where do you find those spiritual practices? How do you stay present and yet create openness for finding, revealing, and activating God's reconciling love in the world? Because that's two things that we're certain of from this text that are absolute. The, God's love and God's sovereignty. God's love and God's sovereignty is what brought Christ to us. God's love and God's sovereignty is what engages us every day of our lives. Every time we open our eyes, we can celebrate and remember what God has done for us. And so I invite you, challenge yourself a little bit. As, as you're making New Year's resolutions, if you do that, if not, just take a stab at this one. When you are thinking about how God reveals God's self to you, 
When God impacts your life, what's your response? When is that happening? When is that causing you to open your eyes to a newly revealed direction, to a newly founded opportunity to serve? Now, while I'm always, you know, any of us are very happy to see, oh, more people want to serve, you want to teach Sunday school, you want to serve a committee, you want to serve, you want to, you know, we'll sign people up for committees. That's what we do very well. But it doesn't have to be about that. It's about our personal journey. It's about our personal relationship with God that helps lead us because the more strength that we have in ourselves, the more strength we can have as a community of faith. And so I invite you, wrestle with that. Think about it. In what ways is, are you opening yourself up for an epiphany from God? What places in your life do you invite God to come in and influence you? Whether through humility, through peacefulness, but always with love. Always acknowledging the sovereignty of God. So friends, in the new year, make it make something. Make it make a difference. Make it count. Because what happens is, often we think about these things for the Sunday morning, and by lunchtime, we forget about them. <laughs> by lunchtime, we have checked them off and moved on. Because, you see, it doesn't happen accidentally. It only happens when you wrestle with it. It only happens when you invite God into those places of your life that are dark, those places in your life that Christ needs to be revealed. When you open yourself up in that way, you're vulnerable, you're open to change, and guess what? Our best laid plan goes out the window and God replaces it. And that's the scariest part is giving control over to God. But I invite you, it, it's, it's such a way of living, it's such a way of existing, knowing that God is looking out for each and every one of us. Because why? Because God is love and God is sovereign. Know that and be at peace. Now please stand and join me in the Apostles' Creed, which you'll find on page 14 in the front of your hymn book. So friends, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
seated. Please pray with me. Loving God, through Christ you call us all into your covenant with Abraham and Sarah. For your church throughout the world, that it may be a faithful witness declaring your wisdom to all authorities. God of wisdom, glorious light, hear our prayer. The wise men came to King Herod in trust, but he betrayed their trust and perpetrated unspeakable evil. For the leaders of the government, that they reject the way of Herod and exercise their authority in truth, justice, and mercy. God of mercy, glorious light, hear our prayer. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus fled before the wrath of Herod and became refugees in Egypt. For all those who suffer from political oppression, injustice, or war, and especially for refugees. God of justice, glorious light, hear our prayer. Joseph dreamed a future for his son and obeyed your will for his family. For all families that may live in peace according to your will, God of peace, glorious light, hear our prayer. The Holy Family lived with neighbors and received help from strangers. For our, neighborhood, for our neighborhoods, that they may be communities of human flourishing, offering kindness to strangers. God of harmony, glorious light, hear our prayer. Holy One, you hear all of our prayers and now we lift to you these health concerns for Grady, Betty, Jimmy, Renee, Lucille, Ava, Lucy, Mike, Kaki, Emma, Karen, Harris, Marion, Cora, Barbara, Lonnie, Nancy, Jane, Mary, Calvin, Spencer, and Lisa. Lord, we pray also for those who weigh heavily on our hearts today. We also lift to you, Lord, all those who serve you in the name of Christ, for the Zamorano family and the Kay family. We pray for the communities that this church serves through living waters, Los Hios, Atillo, Maragorta, Limino, Mara de Platano, Los Corales, Pedra Blanca, Abajo. We pray for all those who boldly serve military service for this country and do their all to protect our rights. And Lord, this day especially, we pray for Reed, Lamar, Brooks and Taylor. Lord, hear our prayers and grant us to live as heirs of your promise through Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God intends to unite all creation so that all may share in the promises of God's new reign. Therefore, with gratitude and joy, let us re render tributes and bring gifts for we have access to God in boldness and confidence through our faith in Jesus Christ let us receive our tithes and offering
glorious God, you led the three men of wisdom to seek Jesus, your holy child born of Mary. Overjoyed in the presence of his radiant light, the men knelt down at the infant's crib and offered him precious gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We too offer our gifts in gratitude, reverence, and thanksgiving for the birth of your child, whom you called to lead the world into fullness of life. So Lord, receive and bless these offerings as a sign of abundant love and abundant life that we are called to share in Christ. Amen. we continue seeking to know Christ, inspired and guided by the Holy Spirit, to make Christ known in the world around us. May we do so sharing the love of God with kindness and humility, patiently seeking unity, this day and forevermore, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sunday morning worship service 
from the First Presbyterian Church, Eufaula, Alabama. The First Presbyterian Church is located in Eufaula, Alabama at 201 North Randolph Avenue, Eufaula, Alabama, 36027. The church phone is 334 687 2523. That number again, 334 687 2523. The church staff is Pastor Reverend Brian Copeland, Director of Music and Organist Steve Hawkins, Church Administrator Renee Nolan, Sexton Veronica Curry.